four years ago, and the song leader was there, and Dr. Peacock, and all that stuff. But so, hey, guys, one of you guys want to ordain with Brother, Bo, uh, Brother Joe Bayano out of uh, Brother Mike Elliott's church in Ohio. So we were walking out, and Brother Sam Magdalene down says, Hey, uh, you guys want to sing a particular song? You just got ordained and all that stuff. And Joe Bayano says, uh, Brother Joe says, Hey, you're the older guy. I'm like, thanks, Joe. Won't be praying for you very much at all. He goes, why, why don't you pick? So that's when we pick, sung at the ordination song, man. Uh, ordination service, excuse me. So, Kathy, what's going on with Zeb? Do you have an update? Uh, he is in IT still. They said that he has a pretty bad concussion, and he will be uh, released as soon as he can do something else. Okay. So not out of the woods yet, doing a little bit better than first, maybe perceived mm -hmm. ATV accident. So, okay. Keep praying for him. Do you know if he's saved or not? I do not. Okay. Okay. We can keep that in prayer, and, and we'll keep it. We just prayed for him a, a minute ago. So, amen. We can, we can do that. So, nothing wrong with that. I could use more prayer in my life, personally, to be honest with you. Well, I'm, I'm a preacher. I pre no. No. You could use... You're reading the Bible, honestly, to me, is much more easy and simplistic. Yeah. That's where I rag on you guys for not reading your Bible, but <laughs> praying, I'm like, yeah, I'll just shut up over here, man. But you need to hear preaching on pray praying. Is the, that's, that's the fuel, man, behind your witness and behind the Word of God. Good old-fashioned Bible prayer, and your flesh hates it. If you have insomnia, read Chronicles or get your prayer list out. You'll be drooling. You'll be a drooler baby in less than a minute, man. <laughs> It'll be awesome, man. You'll have spider webs coming out of your yap and the whole nine. Be pretty cool, man. So, I will say this: uh, good job on Friday night. Not for me, but at the wedding, I like the song we all sung, man. At least half the room was singing. Yeah. Right. Yeah, the, the, quad, the quadrant over here. Man. <laughs> I was watching some of the faces. I was looking around. They're like, there was one guy just kept staring at me, man, because I was just, I was just letting it rip. He's just like. <laughs> You're going to get excited, man, about football games and excited about baseball and everything. And if you're saved and you can't get excited about Jesus Christ, there's something wrong with you, man. So that, that was a blessing to see all the folks there and Guido getting in fights with people and stuff. Man, it, was, it was awesome, man. <laughs> Amen. Almost, but let's pray and then we'll get into the Word of God. Thank you again, Father, for the morning. Thank you for the joy we have in Christ Jesus. It is... Father, the joy of the Lord is our strength. We heard that in Sunday school out of Nehemiah 8.10. And it's the joy of our, our God that gives us strength to go through the days, the times, the seasons that life brings, Father. And I, I pray through the preaching and instruction of the Word of God today, through the power of the Spirit of God, and you using me as such, that these folks will be ministered to by you and not by me. Father, I, I will not ever claim the Baptist way. I'll not ever claim my way. I want to proclaim your way through the book, this Holy King James Bible. I thank you for it, Father. Thank you for the folks who took time out of the day to come here. On the first day of the week, I pray that we would give you all the honor and glory and praise. Do your holy name. Thank you again for Mike and Megan's wedding. What a great picture of the day that we as the chaste virgin will be given to you. And Father, the marriage and the supper and Father, all the wonderful things that are they're going to come from it. Thank you for being a great God, a great King, and a wonderful Savior. And Father, quite bluntly, an awesome husband to us as we stray and go away from you so often. I thank you and praise you. In Christ's name, amen. All right, stand, stand, keep standing with me. Just lead, read a couple verses and we'll get into it. Ecclesiastes chapter number three. Uh, left off last week in, in, uh, about plucking up that which is planted, but I want to start in verse number three. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down, a time to build up, and a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. <laughs> that was the wedding time, you know. <laughs> Honestly, you don't want to see out of shape white people dancing. Okay, let's just let's just cut to, cut to the chase. All right, uh, a time to mourn, a time to dance. Verse five: a time to cast away stones, a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace, a time to refrain from embracing, a time to get, and a time to lose, a time to keep, and a time to cast away, a time to rent, a time to sow, a time to keep silence, and a time to speak. A time to love. You might want that silence part in a minute. A time to love, and a time to hate. A time of war, and a time of peace. Go ahead and be seated. Oh, don't we usually pray? No, we'll mix it up a little bit, man. But I, we're already familiar with the passage. But as we keep going through the times and seasons, I just want to recall 
from last week a little bit, everybody's in a different season in their life. It's not just spiritual growth. It is seasons of life. It could be age. It could, I wasn't looking over here when I said age, but I do kind of, there's like a magnet that's just drawing me over here. But it's, just, it's, it's age, it's kids, it's lack of kids, not having kids in the house. It's married, it's not married. It's, it could be a multitude of things. But we're not in the same seasons in life. And to do this, to compare yourselves among yourselves, it is not wise. That's 2 Corinthians chapter number 10. When you start looking around saying, well, I could have that, or I should have had that, or what if I married her, or I married him, or if I had that job, or didn't it? it no, no, you are exactly where you're at because you made decisions, and God guided you through that. Sometimes he took his hand off and said, you know what, I'm just going to let this person reap what they sowed. But the reality is we're not all in the same station in life, and that's okay. Uh, I would not want everybody to be equal in this church. That wouldn't make any sense. You need babes in Christ. You need young men. You need all that in the growth stage, but you also need people that are different in their age and experience. Uh, like we mentioned last week, Brother Kenny, the time is drawing nigh. The time of Kenny's trouble will be here very, very shortly. And I, I can tell, man, you've got diapers all lined up like BJ's Warehouse, and you got... You got formula for uh, like a tanker parked outside of formula and you're ready to go. But that's your season you're in now. And you're, you're going to have a child, Lord willing, pretty soon. Uh, that's going to change things a little bit. Yeah. It's not going to be as much as, hey, I'm going to go cut out, you know, 10 cords of wood and take down this forest out here. Yeah. No, it's going to be, Kenny, get the baby. <laughs> and that's, that's just the way it's going to roll, man. And that's okay, man. But it's a different season, man. And if you're single, you have a different season. It, 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 it just changes for everybody. And you can't get upset where God has you at. I'm telling you, don't rush to be somewhere in some other place you're not at. Yes. And like I said last week, you died all your life to get to 16 to get your license. And then you died all your life to become 18 so you could do whatever 18 brings. I just think of 18, I think of 666. That's what I think of. Yeah. And then, oh, let's go to 21 because, you know, that's a cool age. I can do a lot at 21 and... And now I'm looking at 57, I'm looking back going, wow, I don't want, I'd like to go back there age-wise and body-wise, but actually I'm glad where I'm at, to be very blunt with you. I'm glad, I, I wouldn't want to have toddlers of my age. Speaking of which, daycare is starting up on Monday, I want, I'm going to rip my eyeballs out like, Zedek, like Zedekiah, and they're going to know that God is real from the top of the stairs. They're going to they're know it. They're going to know it because uh, we had Mike and Megan came over for a little, little preliminary, a little prep on Thursday night, and uh, they had obviously the kids with them, and, and we, were, we were talking a little bit and, and everything, and, and Karen goes, yeah, he comes to the top, and they just hear the voice, and that's it. And if it's cheerful and happy, then they come, oh, David's here, and then that's like, then they're doing something, and then you can, they're all shivering like the little bunny, and they run to the corner, he's coming. <laughs> and then from the top of the stairs, knock it off! And it just resounds all the way through. You say, you say, yeah, man, I, it's, hopefully we don't get sued for that at some point in time. <laughs> but that's the time of season. We don't have kids now. I don't want to go back to having toddlers. I don't want to go back to having babies and all that stuff. But if you have a baby, be glad in the season you have, man. I will say this. Once you have kids, you never stop worrying about them. Yeah. Your dad does worry about you, you know. I worry more about Haley than I do about you, Taylor. But, <laughs> but no, that's only because I feel she's probably going to get murdered by it one day, but or pulled over by a state trooper or something like that. But you, once you have them, it just that season, that season never ends. If you have kids, you, yeah. I can't believe you have a sixty-year-old daughter. Seriously, <laughs> that's unbelievable. But she's do you? Care. <laughs> That, that's, that's beyond the season. Of, that, that's like a season on its own, man. You think about that, but I mean... I, <laughs> but I mean, you, do you ever stop worrying about her? Do you ever stop praying for her? She needs to be saved, number one, but you, you, you consider her, man. You do. That season doesn't ever go away, but you think about it. I played baseball for a little bit during, during, my, during my life, and the, the Major League Baseball season is 162 games. That season starts basically, I know they're starting to bump it back into March. It usually starts in April, and it goes through, and now it goes through November or whatever, but it'll usually, it's supposed to end in October and, and all that, but I mean, six, seven months is day in. You get, you get one day off every 17 or one day off every 20, and it's, just, it's a long season. Football now is through the roof. They're adding games to see because it's all about money, but it's just a long grind, man. And you think, man, I just wish I could get to the end of it. Yo, will you get to the end of it and look and you say, maybe I... I may, 
Just be happy in the season you're in. And that's what Solomon has taken us to through the power of the Holy Ghost under the sun here. And the Bible says this in verse number 3, a time to kill and a time to heal. Now, in our circles, it's easy to kill. Let's be honest about it. King James, charge hell with gasoline breaches, brother. You know, kill them all that God sort them out, you know, and all stuff. And I had that mindset for a while until you realize the grace and mercy of Almighty God has been bestowed upon you. And you walk around with the mentality of killing everybody, you're not going to be of much use to anybody. And, you know, I, we joke around a little bit, but I mean, how do you not see those people at Mike and Megan's wedding and go, look at all those lost people heading for hell? Yes. Yes. Look at all those souls with the biblically sound word, lost. Without Christ having no hope, without God in the world, dead in trespass and sins, and you're just, you just wish you could throttle them into eternity to trust in Christ, but you can't. Yeah. And, but sometimes you get, you know, you see him come in, the blue hair, and you know, the, the sleeve of tats and all messed up, and you're like, doesn't God just kill him? I know you've never thought like that. Or somebody crosses you the wrong way, and you're like, I wish God just bring judgment on him. Well, that time's coming, but wouldn't you rather see him get saved and changed? Because if God killed you every time you deserved killing, you wouldn't be here. Honestly, thank God for eternal security. Because I should be in hell right now as a saved man. My brother texted me this morning, my brother Mark, the long lost brother Mark. I know, can you, you're like, the girls are like, what, brother Mark, Uncle Mark? He texted me, he goes, Dad, Dad, I was just thinking about your 40th anniversary of being saved. He's the one who led me to Christ, man. Pretty cool, man. But I think of 40 years and how many times he should have said, not worth it. Just go to hell. I'll break my word. What are you going to do? What are you going to do if I take away eternal security? What could you do? And sometimes the mentality around, around us is just, God, just kill everybody. Send them all to hell. Show them your judgment, God. Yeah, and then you retract and go, man, I thank God that not all the crops came in that I planted. But there is a time to kill. Go with me over to uh, Genesis. Let's start in Genesis. Be an easy one for you to find, Brother Kenny. Genesis, man. Genesis chapter number 9. There's a season to kill. There's a time to kill. But instead of just pointing that at other people, there's things that need to be killed in my life that are a reproach to Almighty God. Brother Paul, I did appreciate you on Friday night, man. You're a man over there. Yep, yep. I thought you were going to come forward and run the aisles, man. <laughs> Maybe I'm an altar, call at the, altar caller at the fireplace right between Mike and Megan, man. I didn't know, man. It's a blessing, man. Genesis chapter 9, verse 1 says, And God bless Noah and his sons and sons, and then be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Well, because I am the way I am, if you think that's different than what he told Adam after a flood, you're crazy. Yeah. Do you believe in the gap? No, I believe in a flood between Genesis 1 1 and 1 2. Yeah. The same commission given to Noah after a flood is the same commission he gave to Adam after a flood. Well, I don't believe that. I don't care what you believe. The Bible teaches otherwise. But anyway, let's move on and have some fun this morning. Verse number two. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of the air, upon all that moveth upon the earth and upon all the fishes of the sea. Into your hand are they delivered. Every, boy, that sounds just like dominion and everything that God gave Adam. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you, uh, uh, have I given you all things? I can't say because I don't really like salad too much versus meat. Verse 4, for, for, uh, but flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. So before the law is given through Moses, and in the New Testament you see this as thing, uh, drinking of blood, raw blood, all that stuff is absolutely forbidden. Okay, now keep on going with me. And surely your blood of your lives will I require. Look at this. At the hand of every beast will I require it. Now, what does that mean? Uh, we're not going to go there, but in, in Exodus 21, no, 21, 18, uh, if an ox gores a man or gores a person through, what are you supposed to do with that animal? Cuddle it and put a blanket over it? Well, maybe if it's your neighbor, it won't return your stuff. But I mean, uh, you're supposed to take the animal and kill it. Because what did that animal do? It shed the blood of a human being. Folks, I love my animals. I really do, seriously. All kidding aside. Um, but they're not more important than human beings. Yeah. And if you'll save whales and kill babies, there's something wrong with you. There's something spiritually wrong with you that you'll save pandas and kill babies. 
because you fornicated the night before. Let's cut the garbage out. You're a fornicator and a harlot, and so isn't the guy with you. I don't care what you think about that. Where do you stand on abortion? You just heard it. Because 99% of that is because you fornicated and want to take the morning after pill and go kill a, a child that you don't want because it's an inconvenience to you. Yes. So don't be, taking, don't be taking the blood of another, another person, even if it's an animal that does that. Man, Riley has bit my hand so many times, I had to kill that beast. <laughs> at the hand of every beast will I require it, uh, at the hand of every, uh, 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 and at the hand of, uh, of man, at the hand of every man's brother will I require the life of man. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made, past tense, he man. And you be fruitful and multiply, bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply therein. Go over to Romans chapter 13. Now I'm going to say some things as we're turning to Romans 13 about this time to kill. And yes, a little bit of Bible study with a little bit of preaching, but it's good for you. Romans 13, the death penalty is 100% on the table. You cannot be a Bible believer and not be against the death penalty. Well, you know, you did some things you're growing up. Okay, okay, let's stop off that, you know, trying to turn it back on somebody. You murder somebody, you get murdered. Yes. Put them on, give them a chance to get saved, witness to them, but I guarantee you they've already had that chance. Yes. But give it to them again. But guess what? The penalty for you taking somebody's life is you get your life taken. And not this stay of execution, all this garbage down the road. No, your life gets saying, well, what about this? The Bible is very clear about these things. Old Testament, New Testament, before the law, under the law. Look at Romans chapter 13 with me. Now, there's a difference between murder, folks, and the manslaughter death, which you guys know in Numbers 35, right? What did God establish in Numbers 35 for that manslaughter, that accidental death that happened? He set up cities of refuge, right? But when you intentionally murder, like a Joab... You go out and take somebody else's life, like he killed a Mesa and, and Abner, the son of Ner. Well, who else's son would he be? He'd have, be, he have to be the son of Ner if he's Abner. Like, it's going to be Kenny Jr. You know it's Kenny Jr. If it's a girl, it's Kenesha. That's the end of the story. That, that's, I, already, we, I had a discussion Friday night. We laid the doctrine down. It's a man, if it's a man-child, it's Kenny. If it's a girl, it's Kenesha, because we've we, we we got to keep it real with the D Dominicana, man. Amen. <laughs> Romans 13, verse number 1. Let every soul be subject to the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are, uh, be are ordained of God. So guess what? If your favorite, if your favorite or not so favorite representative gets into the seat you wanted, your, rep, your guy to get, guess what? God put them there. God put an oatmeal brain dementia patient over this country. That tells you what he thinks about your country. Your country's a bunch of oatmeal, dimensionated, <laughs> dope-smoking fools yes, yes. who don't know what a male and a female is. Yes. Uh, what is wrong with you, man? Yes. You and I deserve Joe Biden. Yes. We deserve Donald Trump. Yes. A liquor peddling, fornicating... Oh, I think he's conservative. Oh, come, stop it. You're a Bible believer if you're saved. You work through this life with the power of the Spirit of God and the book... And whoever's in charge, and you do what God would tell you to do. How can Peter say, honor the king? Yeah. It is Nero lighting your brothers and sisters in Christ on fire as candles going to his summer house. Yeah. And he says, you ought to honor the king and obey what they tell you. What? Yeah. Yes. One of the things Brother Bird always prays, man, thank God we have the, the police on our side and that the Lord has put the police on our side. <coughs> Aren't you thankful there's no troops coming around to say, stop meeting? Rip your Bible out of your hand, pull you out. I've read, I've read biographies, man, of martyrs and a little girl, man. You, you cross that threshold, they put their Bible on the threshold. You cross this threshold, you leave that Bible behind, you come join us. She wouldn't do it. They took her out. They killed her. Other girls done unspeakable thing to women because they won't reject Jesus Christ. And you live in America and you can't come to church faithfully and read your Bible faithfully and pray, you are an absolute lazy good for nothing. Yeah. I don't like you preaching like that, then the door's right there. Because yeah. it falls on me too. Yeah. Uh, uh, you should take advantage of this air conditioning, carpet, chairs, man. A fine old preacher like yourself, myself up here for you. <laughs> you got freedom to drive where you want, go where you want, spend your money on what you want. Yeah. And you can't serve Christ. 
There's something wrong with you. There's something wrong with your heart, man. But anyway, I digress. Let's get back to it. Let's, let's stop preaching. That's just mean stuff. But anyway, the powers to be are ordained of God is the point of all of that stuff. Well, I wonder who's going to get in them. Who cares, man? Okay, okay, can I just say this and then we'll move on? Seriously. Has any president, any senator, any representative, any mayor, any governor done anything to you that's restricted your life for Christ? Has any one of them really financially impacted you and I? I'm talking personally in this assembly. So why are you getting all spooled out about November every four years and every six years for a senator and every two years for... Why? This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. You are a liar and so I am too. <laughs> no, this world has become your home too much. And you're worried about the red and the blue and the, and the elephant and the donkey and all that stuff. Who cares, man? Serve your God the best you can with the freedom you have. And if the and another thing Brother Burt prays, which he does pray, it's shocking, I know he does, but he prays, he, he, he says, you know what? And if our freedoms are ever taken away, Lord, please help us to serve you even if we lose them. Yeah. I would rather not lose them, I'll be brutally honest with you, as a coward. But I'm going to take advantage of the freedom I do have now. Because you may not have that, depending on who God, but the, Lord, the Lord's in control of who gets where. And what laws get governed, your taxes and all that, they set that up. And we, oh, I'll fight against the government. Do you have any Bible for that? Okay, well, let's get back to verse number two. Things are going well this morning. Who's how, how, long, how many seasons are we going to have? This is going to be the longest season ever. Next to Kathleen having a 65 year old daughter, this is going to be the longest season ever. That just blows me away, I've got to tell you. How do you think I feel? <laughs> I, 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 right, right. I'd like to say I understand, but I don't. <laughs> That's amazing, man. Verse 2 says, Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. Well, I'm not going to hell. No, that's the damnation over in Romans chapter 8. You'll get some stuff getting on you because you won't obey the authorities God put over you. Well, I, don't, I don't like my governor. Okay? You still get a chance to witness to your neighbor? Still if you go get gas to the pump unheated? Take it, get to assemble for free and read your butt. Take advantage of it, man. But don't resist it because you're starting to go against God. Verse number three, for rules are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good, but if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. That's your kill. For he is the minister of God, or revenge to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Folks, there is a time to kill. It is proper and right to go out and kill who God says to kill, and murderers and things that are breaking of law that deserves that deserve to die. God said so. I shouldn't get any pushback on that. You see what? You've watched too many shows. You've watched too many TV broadcasts. You've seen too many bleeding hearts. You've seen too many idiots picketing outside of uh, outside of the prison. That's my baby boy in there. And he, if you just knew my son, I do know your son. He killed three people. Bye. We, 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 we know your son. Well, he's a good boy. What? Well, you just don't know I raised him as a kid. He's not a kid. He's a 22-year-old who killed three people. I'm sure that's what John Wayne Gacy's mother said about him when he killed 31 kids. Dressed up as a clown. He was a good boy growing up. He's not a boy anymore. He's a full-grown murderer and needs to be put to death. Well, I don't like that. The uh, door's right there. I gave you what the Bible said. Well, there are the exceptions. That's the manslaughter and the accidental death and the cities of refuge over in Numbers 35. Well, you're just a murderer. No, I'm not. I'm, we're going to get to the other part in a minute. The point being is this, there is a time to kill when God says kill. So let's just make a practical example of that in our own Christian life. Is there something God's told you to kill that's an idol in your life and you haven't killed it yet? Yeah. Is there something that God told you to get rid of and you still keep playing around with it? There's a time to kill that thing. You keep that thing around and it will kill you. It'll strangle the life out of your Christianity. 
Without question, it will. Look at the Bible says to me on 1 Samuel chapter number 15. 1 Samuel 15. You remember old King Saul, don't you? Start out a house of fire, man, full of the Holy Ghost. He really did. He, at the very beginning, when the power of God was on him, man, he did, he did some pretty cool stuff, man, prophesied and all that stuff. But then we're going to get into a place where God told him to do something, and he didn't like to do it and obey. And we're not going to read the whole thing. You know, for sake of uh, where we're at in the context, many of you have read this over and over again, but I want to get you to the beginning of, we usually go to, you know, rebellion is a sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is iniquity and idolatry, and yes, that is true, that's 100% accurate and all that, but we forget how that's, this all starts. 1 Samuel 15, 1 says, Samuel also said to Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people, over Israel, now therefore hearken thou unto the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, uh, Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. Do you remember that? We preached on Amalek one time about the flesh over in Exodus 17. Now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not, but slay both man and woman. Now see, now what's going to happen right here is this is what you, we're going to all kick back on. Infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. And Saul gathered the people together and numbered them in Tileam, 200,000 footmen and 10,000 men of Judah, and Saul came to a city of Amalek and laid wait in the valley. What did the Lord say through Samuel? When you come up against Amalek, I remember what Amalek did to me and my people. You wipe them out. You don't even let their animals live. Now, see, some of you right now are thinking, I can't believe God would do something like that. You know why God did something like that? Do you remember the man who stood over Saul and killed King Saul? What did he claim to be over in 2 Samuel 1? A, a what? An Amalekite. So what you don't kill and utterly destroy that God told you to utterly kill and destroy in your life will come back and kill you. If God got, said, get rid of that lust of the eyes, get rid of the lust of the eyes. If God said, get rid of the pride of life, get rid of the pride of life. Because one day that thing that you did not kill that God told you out of these stories is going to stand over you and say, I won. Saved on your way to glory. Saved, child of God forever. But guess what? An absolute nothing for Jesus Christ because the thing that God told you to get rid of, you didn't get rid of. He said, utterly destroy every bit of it. And what does Saul say later on? Oh, the people told me to keep the animals and the fatlings. And the, I mean, I figured we'd do a sacrifice to the Lord. Do you see what he just did? He brought religion and God into something that God already said no. So man takes God's word, which is firm, fixed, and fast, and man takes God's word and says, well, let me shape it a little bit, because God really meant this. No, if God really meant it, he would have said it. God says exactly what he means and means what he says. The only gray area is up here. There is no gray area in that King James Bible. I don't understand it all, but I'm not going to change a word of it. It's not going to happen, man. And the only gray area is whether I want to obey it or not. Saul had that bit of reasoning and rationale that, well, God would be pleased with a sacrifice, wouldn't he? No, God would be pleased with you doing what he said. Kill it all. Not just a little bit. So there is a time to kill. Uh, maybe this morning God said, you need to get rid of that stinking, arrogant look you got on your face. Mm. Maybe you got to get rid of that bitterness you got going on. Maybe you got some unforgiveness that you haven't dealt with yet. I don't know. But I know those are the things that slowly and not taken care of is what kills you on the inside. And nobody knows what's going on. You smile and you're joyous and we laugh and inside you are dead or not. Bucket of ball peen hammers, man. And God said, I told you to kill that thing. There is a time to kill. There's a time to get rid of that thing. There's a time in society for it. There's also a time in the life of a child of God. There's a season for it. Well, the Bible says there's also a time to heal. Go over me to Luke chapter 4. Time to heal. The seasons of life, man, we're not all at the same spot. Luke chapter number 4, please. Luke chapter 4, verse 16. The Bible says this, And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. I, I just, this, is, this is just so, this is so phenomenal to me. <laughs> 
you're the God that wrote the Old Testament. Yeah. Don't you think he's got just a little bit memorized? And he still takes time out to read it. Okay, well, maybe the Holy Ghost will show up in your life in a few seconds. Verse 17, And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to, look at this, to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering the sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. You know what one of the things that Jesus Christ came to do? He came to heal people. I think it's so amazing to me that when he deals with those lepers over in Luke 17, and there's, you know, there's 10 of them that come and remember it, and only one turns around and says, gives glory to God and is thankful. I think that's so cool as they're walking, their leprosy gets healed. You want to talk about, you know, George Lucas, <laughs> industrial light and magic. These boys are full up lepers, and as they walk, they're getting healed. He, a man comes up, leprosy in Mark chapter 1, he says, will you heal me? And the Lord says, I will. And he touches a leper. And immediately he's healed. Jesus Christ came to heal people, folks. If you haven't noticed around you, instead of wanting to kill them, which I battle with like you do, we have to apply the healing balm of eternal life through Jesus Christ. That's hard, man. You don't think you get jaded after people flipping you off? I know I joke about it. Or, you know, watch them spit on your daughter on the street. You don't think you get jaded and go, wow, Lord, could you just maybe just hold them in hell for three seconds and pull them out? And the Lord goes, uh, did you just read about my son? He came to heal the brokenhearted. Folks, you know why a lot of them are mean and nasty to us? You know why they're mean and nasty in general? Their heart's been broken. And let me just, let me give you a heads up for you that haven't been around Christianity for a little while. A lot of their hearts have been broken by us. A lot of the folks we minister to, they may not say it or come up. We had one that time in downtown Vernon. She said she'd been done wrong by a preacher in a church that preached the Bible. So you know what her thought is? Everybody that has a Bible or preaches Jesus is going to do something to me. You don't know what you're going to run into, but you have to have the ministry in your heart that you want to heal them and talk to them about healing. You can't cure their leprosy. Sorry, Benny Hinn and all you other phony fool losers. Phony fool losers is what they are. You wear glasses and your ears look like a sippy cup handle. You're, why don't you touch your ears, bro? And I got some African elephants too, bro. So I can tell. Kenny made fun of me. I got to tell this story. Kenny, you know, he's he, yeah, 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 cool, cool guy. You know, I'm sitting there eating over there. We're talking about babies coming. He goes, oh, oh and, and the big ears. How did your mom get your big ears out? I'm like, oh, okay. See, it was the exact Sunday school where it was awesome, where you're tough in the crowd. And then I see, I was like going, Psst. Don't poke him, man. Don't. It was awesome. It's, it's good, man. It's like Jennifer saying, don't, do you know who you're going to, you're doing that door for? Do you know what you're in for? Yeah. Jonathan's like, yeah. yeah. It's good stuff, man. That healing minute, when you don't know what somebody's gone through. And my, honestly, all kidding aside, my first thought is sword. And Jesus Christ's first answer is Towel. What did he do to every one of those disciples that night? He washed their feet. I keep saying it, and I know you've heard it a million times, but he washed the feet of a devil. Yes. And he knew he was a devil. And he washed his feet. You've got to put the sword down, Peter. The sword comes down the road. I'm here to take a towel up and help some people out and heal them. And that's tough, man. It's tough. You know, but you know why it's really tough? Because I love me more than I love them. Yeah. One of the things that Brother Guido always prays is help me, to see, uh, help me to see them like you saw them from the cross, Lord. <coughs> I have to pray that and mean it and actually meditate on it and then do something about it. Because sometimes you can street preach or witness to people just to check the box and get it done and not really care too much about their soul. And that's a horrible place to get in. No, part of the ministry that the Lord Jesus Christ is, I came to heal the broken heart. People are broken, man. 
They're hurting bad. And it's not the time to drop on them and say, you know what, I will forewarn you whom you shall fear. Okay, that's going to come. But is there anything I can pray with you about or help you out, man? Or can I just take a towel out and minister to you? Can I help you out a little bit? I just want to get them the gospel so bad because I want to tell people I witness. I want to tell my preacher I witness to somebody. Well, how about you just say, you know what, I had a chance to buy somebody a cup of coffee. And yeah, the conversation came around Jesus Christ. You know, I love street preaching. I really do. But the best witnesses, let's just cut right all through all of it. The best witnesses, and you guys that witness will attest to this, the best witnesses are one-on-one. -on -one. When you develop a relationship with somebody and the, the doors open and the guard comes down and you actually can sit down and talk to them. I know what the street ministry is. That's proclamation of angels. I understand. But the best times for you and I to witness is that one-on-one. -on -one. There's nobody around but you, them, the Holy Ghost, and the devil. Because you know he's around. And the distractions and the fouls come and all that. But they need healing, folks. And that's a hard thing. There's a season for that. Oh, I just want to kill them all. <clears throat> that's, a, that's, a, that's the easy way out. It's a lot harder to get on your knees and wash somebody's feet than it is to kill them. You can kill them with your words, man. You can kill them with your attitude. You can kill them with a look, man. Yeah, you're saying, I'm not getting soft with the ears. This has bothered me for a long time, man. And contrary to popular belief, I'm not mean to everybody. Just a select few that uh, was preordained by Almighty God. So I'm, Cal <laughs> I, I'm Calvinistic in that term. But you, you do try, because you, know, you, you have to understand what's at stake. It's eternity. Yep. You're dealing with somebody's soul. And you're representing your king. Look what the Bible says to me over in uh, Luke chapter number 9. Another, another favorite spot, Luke chapter number 9. I think we could insert anybody's names in here, but I'm glad he picked James and John. <laughs> but I could put, you know, Dave in there and, you know, Paulie not so much, because after he witnesses, he kind of drifts back off into like a weird ether, you know. <laughs> but, but, I mean, you could, you could put, I mean, as chilled out as Bird is, man, if, it, if there's a certain particular... Stripe a person that goes by, yeah, you'll see the, you see the fur get on the back of the neck, man. <laughs> you know why? It just shows you how much I, Jesus Christ is not in control. I'm not saying there's not a time to answer fool according to their folly. You know there is. But the first admonition in Proverbs 26 is answer not a fool. You typically don't bother with them. Because what's a fool not believe? There's no, they don't believe God. They're deceived in their hearts, so let them go on believing that way. Wait for the one that comes by and says, hey, what are you doing out here? I see you out here all the time. What are those pamphlets about anyway? Yeah. And then becomes that healing opportunity. But these boys have a little different take on it, James and John. Look what the Bible says to me in verse number 51. And it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up. He steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem like a flint over in Isaiah 50, verse 7. And he sent messengers before his face, and they went and entered into the village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him, because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. And when his disciples James and John saw us, they said, Lord, <laughs> well, now that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? Now look at just like Saul, let's get real religious. Oh, uh, he was Elias, dude? Hey, now, we want to be like the great prophet Elijah. <laughs> well, there's somebody great in Elijah around. But he turned and rebuked them and said, Ye know not what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man has not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. How do you think that went on that preaching service with James and John? It was just a one-liner. Lord, you want, can, we, can we just kill everybody? I mean, hey, Elijah did it. And he looks at him and goes, You know not what spirit you are of? I think the, the implication is there, the natural spirit, but I think there's another spirit going on there. Uh, what does the thief come to do in John 10? To kill, and to, and to what? Destroy. What did Jesus Christ say? I didn't come to destroy men's lives. There's a couple spirits going on with James and John, man. There's the human spirit, and there's a satanic spirit behind that. To wipe out everybody in those, those Samaritan villages and just say, you know what, you know what, kill them all, who cares? And God says, really? That's what you think about that? You're just going to kill everybody? How about you try to heal them? Why don't you take your towel out instead of your sword, Peter? That's a hard thing to do, man. You're not looking at somebody that's achieved it, but God's grace trying to work on it. Acts chapter 10, please. Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. A time to kill and a time to heal. Mm -hmm. 
The Bible says this, Acts 10, verse 38. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, verse 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel and preaching peace by Jesus Christ, great smiley face, he is Lord of all. That word I say ye know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power, who went about killing everybody that disagreed with him and didn't like anybody, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Folks, you know I hate other Bible versions. You know I do. I can't stand it. I can't stand our brethren who don't rightly divide. But some really don't know. They really don't know. If they want to learn, praise the Lord. You can teach them. But a lot of folks, I keep saying this as well, because repetition is good for you. Mm -hmm. You and I are fortunate to have the preachers we've had, and I'm excluding me from that, and you know I am. You are fortunate to be around the preachers and teachers you guys have had throughout your life mm -hmm. that have taught you the book and loved the book, and led a good life for the Savior. Not every church has that. Not every Christian has that at their disposal. There are some people that really don't know anything about rightly dividing. They don't know about... Brother Marks told me his testimonies. He finally was like, oh, this rightly dividing. He goes, you've you got to rightly divide. Yeah, but there's some folks like, who knew that? But there's some folks I know that are cross and just nasty and, you know, you're going through the tribulation period and we're all, well, it's all the same, look for the cross, look back, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, you're, they're idiots. And I'll give them some grace because they're my brothers in Christ. If they're witness for the Lord, praise the Lord. But, I mean, they're not going to be in our pulpit. Yeah. Not happening, man. If I know that you believe that, it's not going to happen. And we do draw the line, but some you need to heal them up. They don't know, man. Yeah. They don't know that Lucifer... And Jesus Christ are called the same person in an NIV. Right. Until you show them, they're like, nobody ever showed me that. I wonder why. Yeah. They weren't interested in healing you? But see, what happens with me in my own personal life is like, you should have known that. Or, you know, well, 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 I'm showing you. Look at how smart I am. Yeah, yeah. Somebody showed you who showed them. Yeah, you're just down. You're, the, you're like the, you're the dregs, man. You're, you're just like the last beggar in the pole to throw a piece of bread to another beggar. But it ought to be about a little bit of healing. There is a time to kill. And, and we'll do some killing. It's usually around 11 o'clock on Sunday morning. But there's more time to heal because you guys come in here. I have no idea what's going on in your life. Unless you tell me. I have no idea what's going on. But I trust the Word of God and the Spirit of God to be able to handle that for you. And there might be something going on. It happened to uh, Brother Kenny. He said, well, this is personal, man. I don't care. I want any, anybody want to come to church to have a great time. But it's, this is our family, man. Yeah. Brother Kenny, the, the bell went off for Kenny on, on Wednesday night. I didn't do that. Just ran a reference from over in Ephesians, ran it to Colossians. And Kenny goes, and trust me, Kenny, oh. <laughs> yep. It was like the little yellow dude with the claw coming at him, man, in Toy Story. And he's like, oh. <laughs> God did that. Yep. God maybe gave him something, healed him up in an area he needed to be healed up and he didn't know about. Well, I didn't get much out of the message. What, were you looking for anything out of the message? Were you looking to just come see a guy light himself on fire and scream at you? Well, that'll happen. But maybe you ought to come to get some healing from the Lord and maybe to kill some stuff. Yeah. Go to 2 Corinthians. How, how come you only get through one verse on a Sunday morning? I don't know. It's a gift, bro. It's a gift, man. Paul, you know, man, you're wearing out Romans, bro. <laughs> you, see, you see how it works? Yeah, I know, man. You get, you get caught up and you're like, this is just so cool. Yeah. But see, Paul, because I, I'm, a, I'm a real preacher, and then <laughs> no, <laughs> my hip hurts even more after me just saying, that's it, that's it, man. Paul is going to come visit me in the hospital, man, and he's going to drop a 50-pound dumbbell right on me. <laughs> Catch that. Oh, that's it. It's the only chance you got, so you might as well take it, man. Amen. <laughs> 2 Corinthians 5. <laughs> the Bible says this. Brother Paul mentioned it this morning. He, he hit on it and freaking out going, he better not read too much of this. Man. <laughs> Verse 18 says this, And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. So as much as God's reconciled you in your filthy, wicked, sin-sick estate 
that's the same kind of healing reconciliation I'm to do to other people. You don't, you don't, um, well, I'm just going, let's just throw this a little rightly dividing out for you. Matthew 28 is not your commission. That's Paul only. No, it's not. Go read your Bible. That's got tribulational behind it, and so doesn't Mark 16, and so doesn't Luke. And you, you got to read your Bible, man. The foundation for what we do today is the ministry of reconciliation. A lost, dead world, a lost, dead sinner being reconciled to a living, holy God by his ambassador. Read what the Bible goes on to say in verse number 19, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world in himself, not imputing their trespasses on them. There's nothing wrong with God, Jesus Christ, or the Holy Bible, or the King James, uh, uh, Holy Ghost, or the King James Bible. Everything is wrong with us. Unto himself, not imputing the trespass unto them, and that's committed. Here's your commission. Committed unto us. Who's the us? New Testament children of God. The word of reconciliation. So you don't only really have the ministry of reconciliation, you have the word of reconciliation. Well, that's for preachers. No, it's not. That's not in the context. Every one of us is to be dealing with the enemies of Almighty God, who is anybody that's not saved, with a towel and a healing mentality, with the word of reconciliation to fulfill the ministry of reconciliation. Because that's what he's committed to us. And you know how you do it? The gospel of the grace of God. Taking somebody out and spending some time with them. Make, making a friend with them. Oh, well, they're, well, they're lost. So weren't you. We seem to forget that. And we distance ourselves in this weird, this weird, weird way. No, I am distanced because I'm a child of God. They're a child of the devil, but I have to walk around them every day. I shop. I don't, know, I don't avoid, well, well, Karen's the hunter and gatherer for us. I mean, she... It's the way it is. Woman, thou servest me. I was going to bring that up in, in the service, but I was like, you know, Megan, go, go get Mike something to drink right now. He's getting, <laughs> he's getting nervous up here. But uh, I, Karen doesn't avoid stop and shop because oh, they have wine down an aisle. Yeah. She only gets two bottles anyway, so what's the big deal? <laughs> no, she's she like, oh, uh, no, man, if you have no attraction to that, then who cares? It's your heart. But there might be somebody there who you walk by and say, yeah, man, I'm not thirsty anymore for that. Mm -hmm. What have you been talking before? Go check out. Uh, you, but I'm, you don't know, man. It's the ministry of reconciliation. Yeah. They're children of the devil, folks. Their father is Satan. They're born in Adam. They're going to hell. They're condemned already. You and I are to reconcile them back to our God that reconciled us. Well, 40 years ago for me. You think he was like, well, well I know what he's going to do. I'm not going to waste my time with him. No, he said, I'll save him. In spite of all the foolishness that I, in my foreknowledge, know he's going to pull. He reconciled me. Look what the Bible goes on to say. Now, we, uh, verse 20, now then, uh, we are ambassadors of Christ, though, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ that be you reconciled to God. For he hath made it be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That's the ministry of healing. It's not an easy one to pull off. Everything in your society is based on, well, they're black, they're Hispanic, they're Chinese, you're white, the cops are bad, the governor's out to get you, Republicans don't respect women's rights, blah, blah, blah. I, I don't find any of that in the King James Bible. And the more you get immersed in this world, in the TV of this world, in the media of this world, in the phone of this world, in the Facebook of this world, in the TikTok, and yes, I'm going to keep preaching against it. If you use it for the wrong thing, you're wrong. Get off that foolishness because it'll ruin your heart because it's going to jade you as a child of God where you're already jaded. It's going to just harden you down where you're not going to want to heal anybody or impart to them any healing, reconciliation. And that's not the way a child of God should be. I don't need to be like that. And trust me, <laughs> I, I'm one step away from being, you say you shouldn't be like that. You're right, I shouldn't be. I'm confessing my faults to you. It's, it's something I battle with just like you do. You just mask it different than I do. I just get lines on my face and whip exacto knives into the other people's yard and stuff like that, man. Don't laugh, Jonathan. You're egging me on right now, man. We're just getting ready to close in prayer, and then uh, you're, he's like... <laughs> Back to the story. 
<laughs> Back to the store, another 20 bucks. What'd you do with the first one? I don't know. It's gone. Went home to heaven. Leave me alone. <laughs> it's under the sun. Now it's above the sun. So. But yeah, you battle with the stuff, man. But instead of wanting to kill everything, folks, there's a time coming for that. Jesus Christ is going to set everything right that you and I know to be wrong from this book. It's just not now. Yeah. I, can I just read you one more verse? No, honestly, we've got so much time. I mean, uh, we're, I mean, I mean Jonathan, Jonathan and Jennifer got so much food laid out for me right now. It's, on, it's unbelievable. No, John, that, that's next week. Anyway, John 18. <laughs> it's funny stuff, man. Last verse, and then we're, then we're going to pray. We got through a whole one verse this morning. It was very, very good. It was a little more preaching this morning, a little bit of reading and stuff, but that's, that's okay, man. I don't, I, don't, I don't know. I try not to go by a time factor. I mean, Brother, Brother Knowles preaches literally 25 to 32 or 33 minutes, and it's just right there. Some guys go for an hour, it's right there. I, I don't know. You know, then he becomes an aisle to you where I'm going to preach 21 minutes, and I'm going to preach 21 minutes every time. There was a guy that did that. A preacher that did it. I mean, literally, I'm not exaggerating. 21 minutes. His wife even used to say it. I mean, she, oh yeah, oh, 21 minutes, he'll be done. I'm like, it was. It was like right on, it was bizarre. It's like he had Hezekiah's sundial up in this thing, man. <laughs> and he wasn't asking it to go backwards either. He was like, 21 minutes, bro, we out. We got to beat the folks at Old Country Buffet. We got to beat the Methodists down to Stop and Shot. We got we to go, man. But anyway. I don't know how long to preach, how long not to, not to preach, but trust the Lord will, will do that and submit to it. But I want to read something about it's not now, and then we'll shut it down. Verse 36 of chapter 18 of John. John 18, 36. Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be dealers of the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. The time to kill, even though there's personal application on that and then the capital punishment on that, but the time for us to get the second coming and the blood flowing is not now, folks. We're in the ministry of reconciliation, the ministry of healing people that are brokenhearted, the lost and the saved. Brother Jonathan, pray for us, man, if you could, please. Sunday yeah, amen. Consider it this week and moving forward and put the flesh down and allow ourselves to be served in the nature of Yeah, amen. Pray to help us to be in the word. Let ourselves be molded by that word. I just thank you for the two messages this morning just lining up. At least for me personally, it's just it's time to kill it, it's time to heal. I know I need it. Kill a number of things in my life that they would no longer be present. Yeah, me too. Okay. Amen. Amen. Help us once again to, to humble ourselves, to put ourselves in a position of looking toward you for the help we need or the healing that we need. Amen. I pray you'd help us to, to be wanting to approach people as. Hmm. We need said with with that towel to to help them to cleanse them to help heal them through you to cleanse them through your blood Lord just pray you help us not to miss the opportunities you put before us you know, it seems I say that a lot but I yeah amen amen Lord, amen think of people as, as letting them think they're all set and we know they're not all set and I pray you just help us to have that soft heart Amen. There's not enough to be asked for help. Yeah. Be with us as we go through the rest of the day. Have a safe travel home. Back today, Lord, for all your people. Amen.